for lunch. It's me, Hugh, and uh, we're here. Uh, well, it's uh, our second interview in the new space, and uh, and we're very glad to have Anne Elizabeth Carson joining us. And Anne, it's great to have you here on the show. And we got the book, Laundry Lines. Right. A memoir. Laundry Lines. Right. A memoir in stories and poems. Stories and poems, and this is. Um, I mean, it sounds uh, pretty awesome because. Um, you're uh, in the company of the other great Canadian writers of the 20th century, right? Well, like, <laughs> like Robertson Davies and Margaret Lawrence, and well, carrying on in that tradition, I suppose you might say. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's uh, let's get right into it. I mean, it's this is um, is this uh, stories and poems, right? It's a book about the major event, some a selection of the events in my life and how they relate to the present yeah. and to the future. Okay. Because I've, I've done a lot of work and studying on memory. My book before this was about memory and aging. And, um, it's, and, and realized that it's really critical to tell your stories because your stories are your memories. And if you don't tell them, you lose bits and pieces of yourself. Okay, that's interesting. So that's y y it's important. You're saying it's important to tell the stories for your own. For purposes. your own, yep. For your own sake, and it's also really important uh, in other kinds of ways because our stories are history, mm -hmm. and so you grab your cultural and social history and you connect with all of history. Mm -hmm. So if we don't all tell our stories, what is there going to be left to say? Well, that's interesting. Um, I mean, you think about it today, I, th I think it's important to, I, mean, I agree with you, on the one hand, it's great to have that, and, and yes, and now everybody is has the opportunity to tell their story in a way that they didn't maybe a generation or two ago. Absolutely. Right? But people think of their stories, of telling their stories, that it can only be done in words. But it's not, you know. Uh, people have been telling stories through art and music and dance centuries I mean poetry was born in song and so we recorded our history in song and when you look at some artwork like Frida Kalu you know mm -hmm. her work yeah like that well the, you know that is a painted autobiography her work mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite <laughs> sculptors is Barbara Hepworth and she invented the hollow space in sculpture Henry Moore got the credit for it but she did it first and that was very appealing to women and to feminists because it opened a space. Mm -hmm. And I belong to a, a generation of women, you know, that, that changed history for women. Through well, women's lib and stuff like that? I was born in like 1929, that? and that's when women got the vote. Right. And when women got the vote, that began to open up access to higher education for women. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated from high school and went into university, I was one of four people in a class of 35 that actually went to university. Where did you go? Just curious, and what did you take? Uh, at university? Yeah. I took English and philosophy. And which university? At Here in the University of Toronto at Trinity College. Okay. Yeah. And then there was, that opened up, it's a kind of a progression that opened up uh, access to other professions, Women were, um, if they entered a professional world at all, it would be as a nurse or a teacher. Mm -hmm. So in, in Laundry Dines, um, it begins with a nice, lazy, uh, pastoral description of spending weekends with my aunts mm -hmm. in a farm in Cheltenham. But they were two single women, never having married. Um, and they knew other professional women. And so I was really privileged to listen in on the conversation of people like um, Marion Hilliard. And she was the first woman head of Women's College Hospital. Women's College Hospital had had male heads of the hospital. And she wrote the first book that addressed health issues for women. Mm. And then there was Charlotte Whitten, the famous first, one of the, the, the first mayor of a large Canadian city. Have you ever heard of the home children? No. Well, that was a whole group of kids who were sent over here from Britain. In the war? To work. No. Oh. No. They were 
indentured labor, really. And so Charlotte Witten <laughs> took it on herself to take up this cause. Yeah. And Eva Kuhn, who was the first woman head of the Young Women's Association. So my sister and I, we spent weekends up at uh, Cheltenham. Where's Cheltenham? It's right here in Ontario, near Orangeville. Okay. And um, my aunt had this little cottage, and it had one of those uh, second floors that was had a slopey roof. So when we were kids, we used to lie in the bed and put our feet in the roof. You know, yeah. Listen to all that. And then we'd creep downstairs, and we'd listen to these women. And they were arguing. But you didn't argue when you were a woman back in my generation. That was just not considered to be very polite. They were disagreeing with each other. They were having a drink of alcohol. If you'd come from a, you know, that background, that didn't happen. And knitting all at the same time. And making wonderful meals. And so I grew up thinking, hey, you know, there's, there's more to this business about being a woman than cooking and cleaning and that kind of thing. You can, you can be uh, all of that and you can have a profession. You know what strikes me is, um, is that, that the world that you're describing actually seems so far away now mm -hmm. that um, uh, I'm sure the younger generation takes all of that for granted, right? The, the right. way things are. That's right. But you know, it's kind of creeping back in a way. Think the Simplify movement? I don't know what that is. You don't know what that is? No. Well, it's a whole movement that says, let's get simple. And so you see an article in a magazine mm -hmm. uh, about canning fruit mm -hmm. and vegetables. And this, I really giggle about this, because this is supposed to be brand new and very environmental and very sustainable, and all of which it is, and it's wonderful. But it's as if it had never happened before. I spent every summer helping my mother and aunts uh, put, put up food and so that you ended up in the basement and all these rows of jars of things and, which you lived on during the winter. Well, you're probably just one generation away from the days when we had to actually do that as a matter of survival just to get through the winter every year Absolutely. in Ontario, right? Yeah. yeah. My grandmother, who was the wife of a Plymouth Brethren minister, uh, she and and her relatives and friends, we all spent that. Yeah. Going up to Cheltenham in the summer was a kind of a throwback to that in a way mm -hmm. because it was the country. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the middle of the Second World War, I was 10 when the Second World War began. And we would go up there and the first time I was ever conscious of seeing a whole pound of butter and there was a corn roast and we were presented with cobs of corn and we rolled them in this pound of butter and my eyes were like saucers because butter was rationed during the war. Mm. So it was a, you know, it was a bit of a throwback. Mm -hmm. So here you are and you're still trucking and it's 2015 and you've got a new book out, Laundry Lines. And part of what you're talking about here is, um, I think, is taking some of that wisdom from the previous century, really. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It's and a funny it thing, you know. I never think of it. Hey, that was the last century. But, uh, I mean, in, in 1950 was very different from 1980. Absolutely. Right? In fact, Absolutely. more different than 30 yeah. years from 2010 was to mm -hmm. 1980. Mm -hmm. You know, so much happened. So what are you bringing? What kind of message are you bringing to people? Well, I would say the power of memory that can keep alive the, the essence of of what I'm talking about, the importance of telling stories mm -hmm. for our own survival. Um, there's also language. Uh, a lot of my work, I was a psychotherapist before I began to publish full time. And I worked with people who were not able to articulate their difficulties. And I did work in paint and sculpture and all that kind of stuff. And so I realized that Women and men communicate differently about certain kinds of things. Women tend to communicate in a rather underground, subtle sort of way. And I was brought up, you know, you never, ever talked about family business. Mm -hmm. It was all a secret. 
and mm -hmm. I wrote a book called My Grandmother's Hair, which started me on an investigation of how so much language, so much is hidden, so many voices are silenced. And the, um, the beginning of My Grandmother's Hair is, my grandfather made my grandmother cut off her long chestnut hair and throw it in the garbage because it was unseemly for a woman. Nobody was ever the same. Mm. But that story was never written. Mm -hmm. It was never spoken. It was just absorbed as a family story. And so... You mean that incident? That, event. that incident. How did I know about that? I don't know how I knew about that, but I knew about it. And so then you did, you it, did write a story about yes, it. Yes, I did write a book, which started with that and, 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 and grew about, you know. I could read a little piece from Weaven Men about how that kind of secrecy around never talking about personal matters impacted on me. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah? Um, okay. I storm on. It's part of the first long, long story in the book. And as I say, it had this dreamy, uh, very pastoral beginnings and, and, you know, about the women and what I've, been, what I've been talking about. And then my mother wasn't informed of a, the death of a beloved brother until it was too late. And it was her sisters who didn't tell her. And so that's the preamble. My shock at how these beloved women in my life could hurt their own sister so grievously, my mother's pain at their betrayal, and her anguish that Philip might have died thinking she didn't care enough to be with him, and my recognition of how deeply she suffered, that she could suffer so much, came out of nowhere. A dark family underside whose occasional glimpses I'd consigned to the past and have never imagined possible as part of the women I so love and admire. It engulfs me. I've known them and the world they shared with me in the direct, sensuous way a child sees the world. Growing up, they've been exemplars of an expanded womanhood that I didn't grasp about my mother in our more conventional-seeming home. Since they so rarely talk about themselves, I've no inkling about their relationships with each other or of my mother's iconoclastic side. I assumed that the aunts and my mother were as loving and kind with each other as they were with me. I was brought up by parents and aunts never to ask questions about family matters. There was no place in the narrative that I've lived with them for what they had just done. I'm seized with a heaviness in my chest that's almost disabling. So strong a disinclination, as my grandmother would say, that it's several days before I can continue to write. Picking up the thread of the story again, I struggle with the unspeakable, the unspoken injunction to never expose family business, air dirty laundry, discuss personal life, or reveal personal inadequacies. At the time, I could make no sense of the behavior. Their closed-in silence bordered on the sadistic to me, a mockery of what they taught me about my family, loyalty, closeness, and caring. I wrote a letter to Helen telling her how I felt. I had seen in my aunts, in them, and much worse, felt the awful consequences of how we can be both and see only one. Because I too didn't want to dwell on it. I wanted no tarnish to color the treasured storehouse of images, impressions, and questions that I draw on all the time during the next 15 years. I wanted to carry with me not the betrayal and the secrets and the wounding. I wanted to carry with me the sounds of women talking, arguing and laughing, the everyday, uh, everydayness of their resilience, their perseverance, their adaptability and strength and beauty and ambivalence. Wow. Yeah, okay. So, you know what I'm thinking about? What, what think? that makes me think about is, um, because we're, we're, you're looking at a, 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 the dynamics of the family that existed, what, eight, 
60 years ago. It probably still exists. There, right? It still exists. Does it? Sure. Because, but, I mean, sure. aren't things a little bit different well, now? I, mean, I, wrote, I wrote that passage, um, I guess, about a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. And um, the whole book really began with one of my sons saying, Mom, why don't you write something about family stories? And I said, oh, okay, sure. So I started, and I, he's a, a writer himself, and he read it, and he said, but you need to develop this, and you need to talk about this crisis in your family. So I didn't want to do that. I, I didn't want to write about that at all. It, took, it, was a, it was a struggle. And as I started to write about it, I could feel my chest getting tight. I could feel myself just shaking because you know what I was doing? I was disobeying. I was doing what I'd always been taught that I shouldn't do. So family patterns persist. They just get expressed in different kinds of ways. But then people like you come along and disobey the family uh, right. imperative, right? But so you're it lives in your body, and you disobey the family imperative, and that carries that forward. And that's really been the impetus of a lot of my writing. Well, so, I mean, but, but that whole process of doing that, mm -hmm. of taking that what was never spoken and then bringing it out, not mm -hmm. just to yourself, but to the whole world in, in a book, mm -hmm. uh, is itself a, a change of that family dynamic that enforces that silence, right? And, and it seems to me what you're saying is that, that you need to do that because keeping it all mm -hmm. inside, not speaking it, is actually harmful. That's right. And you need to do that in terms of cultural history and social history because those kinds of silences persist to this day. So I think you need to do it as a way of saying it's possible mm -hmm. to do it mm -hmm. and it's possible to bring this out. I mean, we live in a world where women and children are still tools of war. They're still used. You know, it, there's, that hasn't changed. And bringing that out in the open and really talking about it, and you know that has been the work of the feminist movement a, a lot of a lot of that, and nobody particularly wants to hear it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So here, uh, I mean, so I mean, what you know, writing from a, a part of the twentieth century that mm -hmm. fewer and fewer people have personal experience with, right? And bringing that into the twenty-first century, I mean, what? We've had a lot of social change. I mean, the feminist movement itself was something that started in the early part of your life. And now it seems feminism is almost, uh, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I know this, what you're going right? to say. It's almost, you, you don't need it anymore. It's, it's done its job, and <laughs> now we're moving on to the next thing. Well, I guess one of the things about this book that it illustrates is that, yes, it's done a job, and it's still there's a long way to go. We're very privileged living where we live now. Oh, there In are Canada. millions of women <clears throat> who don't live this way. And here where we live, there's still a 20% wage gap between men and women. You know. There's still glass ceilings. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still there. And there are a lot of people who don't have the language, possibly the education, possibly the courage to be able to speak out, you mm -hmm. know, if if you're a single woman and raising a, several children and you're working two jobs, what kind of time or energy do you have for that? So I think it's up to people who have a little bit more time or energy and perhaps a few years uh, of experience to say something about that. Do you think things are in general um, getting better in terms of families, in terms of the culture in general today in Canada than they were 50, 60 years ago? Yeah, I do. I do particularly in terms of uh, same-sex marriage and children. I have a granddaughter who's in a lesbian relationship and they have a daughter. I'm a great-grandmother. No, uh, yeah, great-grandmother. <laughs> She's 19 months old and I'm going to be seeing her at Christmas time. So she is the daughter of two women. She has two moms and they're experimenting with this. They made a bit of news when they were refused a daycare space. And this, is, this is shows you the contrast. They were refused a daycare space because they were a lesbian couple. So somehow it hit the press and the Winnipeg Free Press got hold of it and the 
uh, CBC got hold of it, and um, my granddaughter's partner was interviewed and so forth. And she said, I wanted other women to know that it's against the law to do that so that they wouldn't be intimidated because she exposed herself to a lot of, of fuss about it. So yes, I think, I think a lot has changed in that way. I mean, so that I mean, just that example of how the family has changed, mm -hmm. right? That would have been impossible. Absolutely impossible. 50, 30 out years loud. Ago. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now my out two loud. aunts. Yeah. Uh, who never married? There's uh, there's been you know some family speculation. Well, why not? Mm -hmm. I've always thought to myself that if I'd had their father, I probably wouldn't have wanted to risk it either, mm -hmm. pre-birth control. Mm -hmm. But they could have been lesbians. Mm -hmm. So do you think, where do you think the family is headed? Where do you think the culture is oh headed from here? Gracious. Speculate another 50, 60 years <laughs> that out. That is a huge question. I just hope that some kind of family organization ex you know, exists. I think it's changing hugely. I mean, you can have two male parents of a son or a daughter. I mean, it's, I think so much is changing, it's really hard to answer that question. Maybe in the future the state can raise all children. God forbid. And let professionals do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was a professional marriage therapist, and I don't think I'd recommend that at all. <laughs> I always say that. No. That's just one of I think men, yeah. a lot of men in general, are allowing their tender, nurturing side to show now. And I think that's changed, too. Okay. And I think that's important. Yeah. Okay. So the book is Laundry Lines. Right now, are you going to be doing any uh, readings or anything in Toronto or anywhere else? Uh? I, uh, I'm having a break now. The book was launched on the 21st of October, and I did a whole bunch of stuff. And so I'm having a break, and then come January, I'll be reading in some libraries, and University Women's Club, and now Hamilton. Are you going to and announce here, here and there. You going to announce any of that on your website and Carson. Oh, absolutely. Com? So people can go there and yes. they can find out when and yep. where you're going to be? I have a very efficient, very young, lovely young woman who helps me do that. And so she keeps me up to date. Okay. And in the meantime, um, who is the book for and where can they get their hands on it? Who, who do you think really should consider getting a copy I of the book? I think anybody who's interested in how stories carry our history... And I don't know who that is. I mean, I have younger friends who think it's fascinating and older friends who do too. So I don't know. It's available in libraries. It's available through the publisher who's Inanna Publications, which is a, a, a well-known feminist press okay. in Toronto. It's available at Book City mm -hmm. and from me. So they can go to your website yes. and click and yeah. get the book. You can. All right. Well, listen, it's been great to have this conversation. Thank you for and, having and me. And I really hope we can maybe do some more at some point because I know we just barely scratched the surface well, we here today. So thanks for coming in and doing this. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Okay, great. And fun. Yeah, fun. It's all about fun. Okay, we're going to take a little break here on Liquid Lunch. We're going to come back with our next guest as Liquid Lunch continues here on ThatChannel.com.